All right, welcome back to lecture six. This is part B, so the second part of a two-parter. Um, we're going to continue with some more examples of differentiation. Um, let's take a look at this one. So let's find f of x for the function f of x equals the square root of x. Okay, so let's find f prime of x and and then once we've found the derivative um, let's find the slope of f at x equals 1 and x equals 4. Okay, so we'll just kind of emphasize that we can do such things with the derivative. So first we got to find the derivative. Now in the next lecture, we'll get into how to find derivatives efficiently. Right? Um, we'll 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 get into that in the next lecture. But right now, the only way we know how to find derivatives is using kind of the machinery of the limit definition that we had. So that's what we're doing. But just know, you know, I think I remember when I took calculus, and my teacher didn't tell me ahead of time that hey, you're gonna. You know, there's an easier, there will be easier methods for finding derivatives. I remember being like sort of dumbstruck by the sheer laborious nature of finding derivatives in this manner. And so I was like, I was much relieved when I discovered that, but um, I'm letting you know in advance so that you don't have to feel the same frustration. Just know that there are nice, easy ways to find most or many of the derivatives of interest. So. But this is the hard way to do it, and we're going to stick with that way, just for a couple more examples, so that we can, you know, kind of drill it into our brains how this thing really works. Okay, so f of x plus delta x minus f of x, all divided by delta x. That's the definition of the derivative, and so plugging in the specific function, we would have x plus delta x, the square root of that, minus the square root of x, divided by delta x. Okay. Now, sometimes, as I'm sure you'll agree, math is tricky, and <laughs> tricks it will exist that you maybe had never even conceived of. You might look at this and say, how in the world am I ever going to evaluate this limit with that delta x in the, in the denominator? Well, we're going to have to get rid of it somehow, aren't we? And so, what we can do is we can do an old trick from algebra. Whenever you have something in the denominator that you don't like, try multiplying top and bottom by something else. Okay, and so what we're going to do is multiply the top and the bottom by x plus delta x plus the square root of x. Okay, and we can do that, right, because, well, because this is, uh, this is this this factor that we're multiplying on here is equal to one, right? Irregardless of what all those quantities are, if you, you know it's a ratio of the same thing. So same thing over the same thing equals one, right? So we can do this kind of thing. And when we do this, our denominator no longer has the same problems. And so let's just do uh, let's let's multiply out the top. Right, so x plus delta x times x plus delta x is going to give you an x plus delta x. Right, these are square roots. You multiply the two square roots together. It's like squaring the square root, and you undo it. And then you're going to have two terms that are plus or minus the square root of x times x plus delta x. And so those will go away, and then you're left with minus x up here. Okay, and then in the denominator, Let's just write it like this for now. Right, so just kind of putting them in there together. Now, if you look at that numerator, the x and the minus x undo each other. And so what I have is uh, basically a delta x in the top. And then conveniently, I have a delta x times this other factor here in the denominator, like so, right? Now, obviously, these are going to cancel. And this was my chief source of uh, concern. And that is going away now, which is nice. So I have the limit as delta x goes to 0 of 1 
divided by, now I just have this term, which I can evaluate this limit at x plus uh, delta x, that's a square root, plus square root of x. Okay, so uh, what happens when delta x gets uh, infinitely small? What happens when delta x approaches zero? Well, this piece under the root goes to zero, and so what I'm left with is one over two times the square root of x, right? Because I've got a square root of x plus something that's be becoming zero, and so this piece of it here goes to zero, but you still have the x, and then I have square root of x plus square root of x, just two times square root of x, okay? So the derivative is one over two times the square root of x. Okay, and so I could find the slopes, right? So my first slope I was interested in was uh, at x equals one. And so that's just gonna be equal to f prime of one, which is one over two times the square root of one, which is a half. Okay, and the other one that I was interested in was at four, x equals four. So that's just f prime of four, which is one over two times the square root of four, which is one fourth. So uh, let's take a look at this function and see how it looks, right? So you might remember what the square root of x looks like as a function. I'm gonna try to draw it reasonably well. Um, yeah, so it kind of goes like this. And so here at, so this is one, it goes through there, it goes through zero, zero. And then out here at two, three, four, it should be equal to two. So I'll just kind of try to draw this reasonably well. Kind of looks like this. Okay, now this doesn't ever turn back on itself, so it kind of heads off, right? And it, it grows, you know, without bound, but uh, slower than you than normal. And so this would be the point one one. This would be the point four two. Okay. So what we've said is that at this, at the slope, the slope here at um, one, you know, basically the slope here is a half, and then the slope here is a fourth. Okay. So these slopes are kind of dying off. Now, what you would discover uh, as you know, as we kind of move closer and closer to the point zero what we would discover is that the slope of the tangent lines will be increase and they'll increase rapidly until the tangent line is basically vertical at x equals zero. Okay. So, very nice. Now the reason you get such a crazy you know, issue here with the denominator is that, I mean, this is a f of x equals the square root of x has you know limitations with its domain right now, clearly this can't x can't be a negative number so x is greater than or equal to zero at all times or right? that's the domain of the function so that kind of can lead the derivative calculation to being a little bit a little bit screwy so uh, let's do another example um, let's talk through let's just kind of do something a little more applied. So what's the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1 half for y equals 2 over x. Okay, so kind of trying to get into some different notation here. So dy dx, okay, that's equal, equal to the derivative with respect to x of two over x, just kind of plugging a bunch of stuff in. Well, that's gonna be equal to the limit as delta x goes to zero of, now here it's, well, let me, let me make sure to write it here. f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x this one is a little bit weirder because the x is in the denominator, right? So you wanna be careful when you're plugging this all in. So f of x plus delta x is gonna be two divided by x plus delta x. 
okay, like so. Okay, and then minus f of x would be 2 over x, and then d delta x down below here. And so we can, I think probably the best place to start would be to combine these numerators and sort of resolve this fraction within a fraction situation. So limit as delta x goes to zero. Now we're gonna have to get a common denominator here, so let's make it 2x minus two times x plus delta x, and then the common denominator will be x times x plus delta x, and then the whole thing is over delta x, let's not forget. Okay, and let's, uh, and remember this is like delta x over one, so it'll be the limit delta x goes to zero and now it'll really be 2x minus 2 times x plus delta x divided by this thing okay and then times 1 over delta x so just kind of being explicit about what we're doing here and so we gotta you know kind of combine all of these things together so limit delta x goes to 0, 2x minus 2 times x plus delta x all over x times delta x times x plus delta x. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the long way around. But just to make, just making sure that, I, I mean, because I know people should be ready for calculus, but a lot of times some of this like algebra can be a little hairy. I just want to make sure that going through each of the steps very explicitly so people don't have any, you know, any hangups over exactly how things are being calculated. So now up top here, let's just clean this up a little more. So I've got basically 2x minus 2x minus 2 delta x. All right. And down below, I've got the same Okay, so obviously up top the 2x and the minus 2x go away, right? And so I'm left with negative 2 delta x all divided by this stuff again. So I know that, you know, you may be looking at this and just like feeling exasperated by the, the length of the calculation. I'm So obviously I'm not cutting any corners. I'm doing every step explicitly on here, which you don't have to do. Um, the other thing to notice here is that, you know, as I said, this is like a temporary calculation for us. We're not going to be calculating derivatives like this for long. So just make, just take your time with this, recognize that there's only a finite number of these that you're going to end up doing in your life and just, you know, just indulge yourself and like, don't be afraid to write the same denominator three times without changing it. Just, uh, the key here is not speed. The key is accuracy, okay? And so what can we do? Well, we can cancel these delta x's and that's key, right? Because if you don't cancel the delta x then when this delta x goes to zero, it brings everything with it and that's the problem. So we get the limit as delta x goes to zero of negative two divided by x times x plus delta x, okay? And now we take the limit basically this term is going to drop out. It's going to become inconsequentially small. And so you get negative two over X squared. All right. So dy dx equals negative two over X squared. And remember our initial uh, ask was to identify the slope of the tangent line at x equals one half. And so we now have the derivative function and we can just evaluate the derivative function at x equals one half. And so we could say, there's different ways to write this, but you can evaluate it like this. So it's equal to negative two divided by one half squared. So that's negative two over a fourth, which Again, doing the math, negative two over one times four over one would be negative eight. So the slope of the tangent line of the function y equals two over two over x is equal to negative eight. All right, good. So 
that is um, another example. Um, now we, our definition of the derivative, right? There's a lot different ways to define this. The definition we've been running with is f prime of c is equal to the limit as. Um, oh, sorry. F prime of x is equal to the limit as delta x approaches 0 of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta of x. So that's been the kind of the definition we've been working with. Now, at times, there are other definitions that you can use. Um, one particularly handy definition is goes like this. So it's basically just a, a, a a change in the way that we denote some of these things. So let's imagine we have our function here and we've got our two points just like before. This is the point C and now this time we're going to name this point X. Okay, So this point here is C comma F of C and this point up here is X comma F of X. Okay, So these naturally are c and x evaluated with a function and so this horizontal delta x uh, can be thought of as x minus c and this vertical delta y can be thought of as f of x minus f of c right so it's just this distance is this height which would be your f of x over here and it minus this height which is your f of c okay so I, hopefully you can see that this is literally just a different way of kind of labeling things, right? It's not like a totally different definition. It's a different way of sort of articulating the concept and just using different notation. And so what this would lead to, this leads to this labeling leads to a definition f prime of c equals the limit as x approaches c of what's the change in y delta y over delta x and so delta y is f of x minus f of c and of course delta x is now x minus c right so this is just another way of saying uh, let's bring x closer to c bring this point closer and let's calculate the tangent line, the slope of the tangent line as these things get closer and closer. And in fact, let's take the limit as x approaches c, which means x sort of disappears into c, becomes arbitrarily close to c. Um, and this is just a different way of articulating that whole process. Okay, so this form has its uses. So this form is useful uh, when thinking about continuity and differentiability. Which is what we want to go into next. We want to talk about specifically continuity, differentiability, and their relationship. All right, so do you need, does one guarantee the other? Does the lack of one mean the other is not true? Like, what's the implication? How how do the two, or how the two are how are the two related? Okay, so we're going to get into that, and that's kind of the motivating reason for introducing this kind of updated definition. Now, when you think about this definition, notice that the existence of this limit uh, requires that the left and right hand side limits for the same point C exist and are equal. Okay, so specifically we would need the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x minus f of c over x minus c. That needs to exist and be equal to the limit as x approaches c from the other side of the same ratio, right? The same the same uh, the same function here. So these two need to exist and be equal, and that's something that we need to explicitly say with regard to this definition. Now, the other previous definition, right, a delta x was going to zero, and uh, 
intuitively like the distance the change the change in x is kind of thought to be a positive quantity um and so we didn't we didn't we didn't have to explicitly state this but here it's important right here it makes it's in, makes sense and is important to state and in particular we're going to use these to examine situations where continuity maybe doesn't exist and where you know potentially continuity does exist but differentiability doesn't exist that kind of stuff right and so we'll take into account the left and right hand limits for some of the examples that we're going to look at so let's start by looking at an example of what happens if we attempt to calculate a derivative at a point where we do not have continuity okay so what happens if we want to try to calculate a derivative at a discontinuity okay so let's consider a function we've seen in the past let's consider f of x equals the greatest integer function okay now remember what this one looked like i'll draw it again Okay, this is like a step function, right? So at every integer, the thing would step up. Okay, so for example, it would exist here, and then it would jump up, and there'd be a hole, and then it would jump up, and then there'd be another hole. And the same thing was true here, down below. Right? And so on. Basically, we have non-removable discontinuities at every integer value. Everything in between the integers, just fine. Continue continuity there, but we have these discontinuous jumps. Okay, um, so what happens when we attempt uh, to evaluate the derivative at a particular integer value? So let's take like x equals zero, for example. Let's, let's calculate the left-hand limit first. So the limit as x approaches zero from the left of, remember it's f of x minus f of zero over x minus zero. Okay, now remember x is approaching zero here. So what happens, let me, let, let's write this here. Let's put the actual function in there. So this would be the greatest integer value minus zero okay divided by x minus zero I'll just put x okay so what happens here well in the numerator so we're approaching zero from the left hand side right so the function isn't defined at zero but we're just getting close to zero and so what happens um, to the numerator well, we plug this in, right? You end up with a zero up top, right? And so <clears throat> the value of the limit goes to basically zero divided by uh, x approaching zero, right? So it becomes infinite. What happens from the other side? The limit as x approaches zero from the right-hand side, okay, same same function here okay so if we're approaching zero from the right hand side the what happens you get a one right so here we can see that basically the two limits do not produce the same value okay right so this is going to be like x over x right so it all cancels out and you get a one right so it works there here x is stuck in this negative as we're approaching the absolute the this guy stays negative but this guy's going to zero so the whole thing actually goes to negative infinity right and so here you've got basically two of these guys that just don't agree and so that means that the limit as x approaches zero of f of x minus f of zero over x minus zero does not exist. 
right? So this would be what defines the derivative, right? So obviously the derivative at zero does not exist either, okay? <clears throat> and so in this case, the function is not continuous at x equals zero, hence the jump discontinuity there. And so we can see that it is also not differentiable, okay? So it is not differentiable because it is not continuous. Okay, all right. Um, however, it is, so what we've just seen is that not continuous, in this case implied not differentiable. Okay, so that's one side. So this is just a specific example. Let's, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens when we have, uh, what, what we'll see is that differ, continuity does not imply differentiability, right? So it is possible for a function to be continuous and yet not differentiable, okay? So uh, let's talk about an example that kind of gives us that scenario. And the function that we'll use here is f of x equals the absolute value of x minus two, right? So remembering what this looks like. So here's one, here's two, three. Okay, so what this does is it comes down here and it goes like this. Okay, so this is the absolute value function, right? So one of the things that we probably, you can probably tell by looking at this, like if you try to imagine uh, what the tangent line is going to do here, uh, it's very easy obviously to see what the tangent line is gonna do on this region of the function and also on this region of the function, but what happens here? What happens at x equals two? Does the tangent line look like this? Does it look like this? Does it look like this? How do we know? Right, so there are, it appear to be options. <laughs> and so I think what we'll discover here is that this is an example of a function that's continuous. There are no gaps, no, no, no discontinuities, but it's a function that is not differentiable. And so we can see this specifically at x equals two if we try to find f prime of two, okay? So f prime of two would be equal to the limit as x approaches two, we're gonna check it from the left and right, and specifically of x minus two minus zero over x minus two, okay? And well, so remember this is this here is f of two, right? So f of two is zero, that's where that came from. But what you can see is that this limit here would evaluate down to being a negative one. So if we're approaching two from the left side, you can clearly see that the slope here, the slope of this section is negative one and that's indeed what you get with the left hand limit. I don't wanna do it that way. So what happens with the right hand, li right hand limit? Well, as we're coming down this direction, right, so x is you know above two then what you're going to find is that this guy here is going to evaluate to a pot so this guy here would be a positive value whereas here it was negative the denominator was negative and that's what produced the negative one here it's positive the numerator is obviously also positive and so you get a positive over a positive and so you get the right hand limit is equal to one right so the two are not equal okay and so that that's sort of where the differentiability the lack of differentiability comes from. You can't calculate an actual derivative at this point. So f prime of two does not exist, okay? Even though this function is perfectly continuous here, there's no gaps, there's no uh, hole in the domain, there's no remo non-removable discontinuity, no asymptote, nothing weird. It's just, uh, that the curve, you know, the idea of a, of a tangent line here just is, is simply not workable, right? 
there's no way that a unique tangent line could exist at this point. And it bears out in the definition when you try to actually calculate the derivative. Okay, And so even though we haven't really proved this, this is kind of the way it works. Um, differentiability. Differentiable implies continuity. Right? If a function is differentiable at a given point, then the function must also be continuous at that point. Right? So f prime of 2 exists implies f is continuous at x equals 2 basically is what that's saying. Now the reverse is not the case, right? So continuity does not imply uh, differentiable. And that's what we just saw with our previous example. We saw this with f of x equals x minus 2 up to the value. Okay, so we saw a counter example where we had a continuous function that wasn't differentiable. So a function may be continuous and still not differentiable, yet if it is differentiable, it must be continuous. Okay, um, there it is. So I think that will be a good, that's a good place to end our introduction to differentiation. The next videos will, um, the next lecture will be, we'll, we'll get deeper into differentiation. We'll, we'll start uh, uncovering some of the basic differentiation rules. We'll start with examples of, of how you might identify differentiation rules, and then we'll just start like stockpiling them, start building them up. So we will see you then.